Good afternoon. I'm Tom Leonard, a senior senior fellow and president emeritus at the Technology Policy Institute, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's panel on big tech big tech antitrust reform proposals. Congress is currently engaged in a bipartisan effort to enact the first major antitrust legislation in 45 years. In June, the House Judiciary Committee approved a package of six reform proposals based on the Antitrust Subcommittee's 2020 report on its investigation into, co into competition in digital markets. Companion bills have been introduced in the Senate. These, these bills are targeted specifically at the leading tech companies, which have been subject to a range of criticisms, but the basic complaint is that they've grown too big and powerful and that, anti and that antitrust has not kept up. The bills target a wide range of activities, including merger enforcement, various types of purportedly discriminatory activity, self-preferencing and conflicts of interest, data portability, and interoperability. The critical question is whether these proposals would yield benefits, and if so, whether those benefits would be sufficient to outweigh the costs. To discuss this, we have a very distinguished panel of antitrust and competition experts. And I'm gonna read through, through the names and give a very, very brief uh, bio, and then we'll get into a conversation, which, uh, which will be hopefully informal and, and uh, lead to a lot of give and take. Uh, Judy Chevalier is the William S. Beinecke Professor of Finance and Business at the Yale School of Organization and Management. Her research focuses on the impacts of new technologies on firms, individuals, and policy. She has written extensively on the economics of the retail sector, both in e-commerce e e and uh, brick and mortar. Maureen Olhausen is partner and co-chair of the Antitrust and Competition Law Practice Group at Baker Botts. Maureen spent many years in senior positions at the FTC, ending up as commissioner and acting chair. Carl Shapiro is professor at the Haas School of Business and the Department of Economics and Transamerica Professor of Business Strategy Emeritus at UC Berkeley. In government, Carl has served as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors and twice as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Economics at the Antitrust Division. Larry White holds the, Ro the Robert Cavish Professorship in Economics at the NYU Stern School of Business. He has served as chief economist at the antitrust division at a time before, well, and, and also as a member of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board and senior economist at the CEA. And finally, finally, Josh Wright is a university professor and executive director of the Global Antitrust Institute at the Scalia Law School at George Mason. He also holds a courtesy appointment in the, in the Department of Economics. And from 2015 to 2015, he was a commissioner at the FTC. Thank you all for being here. And let me start out with a kind of a few baseline questions to, to provide some context when we get into uh, some of the details of the bills. So first kind of baseline question, uh, what should the goals of US antitrust policy be? And should the goals of antitrust be broadened beyond the current focus on uh, consumer welfare and uh, economic efficiency. So that should be an easy one. Who wants to grab that? Sure, I'll go first. Sure, uh, promote competition and avoid widening uh, the, the goals. Uh, to do that, you risk dilution of the core um, function of the agencies, the core mission, uh, they would have to expand their expertise. Uh, you just, it, it's just not a, a, a worthwhile direction to go. The broader issues, of course, they are worth considering, but considering at a broader, higher level than the enforcement agencies, those trade-offs ought to be figured out at the legislative level in the courts and at the presidential level at the higher administration, not at the uh, enforcement agencies. Anybody want to add to that or? Look, I, I would put it 
I favor the pr promoting competition standard that we should, antitrust should be about promoting and protecting competition. Consumer welfare standard is a particular way of thinking about things that helps and in some cases doesn't help in other cases if you're trying to protect competition among employers to, to hire workers. Consumer welfare standard is not the right term. Like what? The principle is protecting competition and promoting competition, broadening beyond that to something else about protecting small businesses or uh, dealing with income inequality seems to me beyond the scope of what antitrust law can realistically do. And there are other policies for those goals. Um, and, and let me uh, add to what Larry and Carl have already said uh, to, to make the point that once you start introducing you know, these possibly conflicting uh, goals and certainly not goals in which the FTC or the DOJ can claim particular expertise, um, I think you end up creating a system where you have you know, institutions that are not well suited to make you know these balancing tests or you know you know pursue what's going to make society better off. Um, it makes the decisions unreviewable. It makes the uh, enforcement unpredictable, um, and I think that creates a whole host of um, introducing you know very different, you know, political, um, you know, essentially people's political preferences being just taken up and, you know, they decide here's the number one goal that I want to pursue in antitrust. And, you know, that ch may change from uh, enforcer to enforcer. Uh, so consistency, I think, really goes out the window. So from an institutional viewpoint, I think it also creates enormous problems to move away from um, a standard for antitrust that's pursuing consumer welfare or even the competition, the standard that Carl's talking about. Um, I might just quickly add there. Um, I mean, I think we, it seems like there's a lot of agreement on these points um, on this panel. I would say that if you move, anti, if you attempt to use antitrust policy to do things like, as Carl mentioned, address income inequality, that's both, uh, I think other panels have pointed out the problems with using antitrust policy in that way. I also think if you're trying to address problems like income inequality, there really are more effective policies out there. And it's if that's your goal, it's a bit of a distraction to be thinking of antitrust policy as the route you're going to take to achieve that goal. Um, so I, I would, I would, I think you can both think that the scope of antitrust policy should remain with its current concerns and be sympathetic to some of the other policy goals uh, that people are, I think, misguidedly trying to use antitrust to achieve. Okay, um, I tried to find something to disagree with, with something someone said, but I, I, think I, uh, I think I'm in agreement all the way around. So let me just add um, a, a, a small, sort of uh, a point is that we do have some experience in this country with an antitrust system that does try to do a lot of things at once, uh, that has tried to you know, maximize four or five, six things at the same time. And the state of play uh, that we ended up with was one that nobody was happy with uh, in terms of the antitrust system. We got not, not, not skeptics of antitrust, not fans of more progressive antitrust, um, you got a system that was intellectually incoherent in a lot of ways, and I think not capable of uh, being tweaked or modified to be more active in areas where, you know, uh, Carl mentioned, you know, no labor markets. And, you know, maybe the consumer welfare standard is ending up in funky decisions there. Try reading the sports antitrust decisions and making sense of them with the, the rest of the body of law. Um, you end up with a system that's really not capable of small tweaks to improve performance because you've got stuff that's not, as Maureen pointed out, not judicially reviewable. I think you get a, a bit of an animal that's hard to, hard to tinker with and have slow sort of productive evolution. Okay, next, next context question. And maybe Josh, uh, you might wanna go first on this. Uh, uh, so one, a, a principal motivation for the push in Congress for new legislation uh, is that is the view that the U.S. has uh, has a lax has had a lax enforcement 
uh, regime. So uh, has antitrust enforcement in the US been too lax? So I'm, I, I think the jury is still out. Evidence is being produced and sort of what's happened o o over time. You see sort of competing papers. Everybody loves to point at the sectoral level C50 stuff uh, and then make causal claims about antitrust. I don't take any of that um, to, to be very, the, the causal claims, the work is just fine um, for, for doing what it says. Most of the recent attempts to do market level work has suggested at least in a bunch of markets, some concentration going down, some going up, a bunch of them, which we know since the 60s could mean either which way for more or less competition, um, but a bunch with marginal costs falling. Um, my, my sense is that the claim that there's systematic evidence of lack of competition, and that is because of lax antitrust enforcement, is that the evidence doesn't support the claim. Um, if I look around the body of evidence, and I have two bodies of evidence in mind, I mean, sort of one is in the markets themselves, um, not for sort of individual, we could all pick cases we think the courts got wrong or decisions we would have done differently either, either direction. Uh, but in terms of systematic evidence of a failure of competition, either in the markets or in the courts, I don't really see it. The plaintiff win rate in merger cases sits around 90%. Mergers are presumptively unlawful when the firm has a share over 30. One firm in the history of all the land has successfully invoked the efficiencies defense in court. When I, so when I look for a crisis of the, with the tools uh, being used in court, again, we could have a fun dispute over individual cases, but I have a hard time um, believing uh, that there's a crisis either in the courts with antitrust law uh, or uh, finding evidence to support the claims that there is a failure of competition sort of systematically throughout the economy and that that is due to lax antitrust enforcement. Yeah, so you, that was actually my next question was gonna be about whether there is a, a concentration problem, a growing concentration problem, So, you, but you combine them. So maybe for the rest of the panel, they can combine them too. So it's two kind of so, somewhat separable issues. Is there a growing concentration problem? And two, has antitrust enforcement been too lax? So anybody else wanna? Let me jump in and I, we will get some disagreement here because um, the issue well, that's, that's, that's of looking at cases that are brought and percentage wins, that's just the wrong way to be judging the vigor or, or laxity of enforcement. Um, you know, it, I've written papers on this. Um, it, we don't see very many prosecutions of bank robbers, okay? Does that mean that we are lax in the enforcement of the anti-bank robbery laws? No, it means that uh, there don't seem to be very many banks that get robbed. And so there aren't, you know, in fact, the enforcement is pretty good. You cannot judge enforcement by the number of cases that are brought, you need, and, and neither can you judge it by the percentage that one side or the other side wins, because as I think all the uh, my fellow panelists know, there's this really insightful article. It's now 37 years old, I think, by George Priest and Benjamin Klein. They're talking about what cases go to trial, what gets settled, what get appealed. This is not random. And so, Larry, as a Larry, as a Ben Klein student, I'm I am forced to say, I promise you, I understand the point, or he would have never let me left, leave the school. Uh, so I, let I, let me say, I'm responding to something specific. I I don't think you can point to the win rates to talk about the quality, the distribution of cases. There is a specific claim being made by those who want to reform the antitrust laws that they cannot win good cases when they get to court, that they present evidence of harm and they cannot win those cases. Uh, they cannot win those cases because uh, judges believe too much as, about efficiencies, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, I, I'm going to agree. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint that we're actually not going to disagree right, about the, the point right, you made. Right, we'll find something right, to disagree about right. later. But, but let um, me then just finish the point. Oh, thank you, right, Josh. I knew that. But let me let me uh, let me just finish the point. The right way to judge about whether things are too lax are where is the line 
between what uh, goes through and what gets stopped. In the merger area, I think as everybody knows, uh, my good friend, co-author, co-editor, John Quoka, uh, I believe has written a convincing uh, study that says merger policy has been too lax over the past couple of decades. Too many mergers went through the close cases that went through maybe with some fixes that didn't work all that well and prices subsequently rose. Um, in the uh, other areas, one would want to try to look and try to define a line of what's allowed, what gets stopped and ask, is that line in the right place from a, a social um, efficiency promoting competition perspective? That's the right way. Try to define a line and ask, is the line in the right place? So let me ask the, the other panelists to, uh, to, to respond to that. Is the line in the right place in mergers and in, in other enforcement uh, action? No. Uh, I'll, um, no, I don't think it is. I think that antitrust, the case law has evolved over the past 40 years or so to be too lenient. Um, both in mergers, as the structural presumption has been weakened that the Supreme Court established in Philadelphia National Bank, and in non-merger cases, as the Supreme Court especially has been more and more hostile to Sherman Act, to plaintiffs in Sherman Act cases. I recently wrote a paper, it's in the Antitrust Magazine, it's also on my website at UC Berkeley, called Antitrust, What Went Wrong and How to Fix It, that explains what happened. Uh, and how this was, uh, the courts were following a Chicago school ideological bent that was not well supported by economic evidence uh, or economic theory uh, as, it, as it has evolved. So the line is in the wrong place. Um, I can say that from personal experience, having testified in a number of cases for the government and having been calling for stronger antitrust enforcement for at least 25 years now. Um, the Qualcomm case is a good example in a non-merger area where the Ninth Circuit, you know, has a, a very poor opinion. The American Express case in the Supreme Court is another example. Uh, losses for plaintiffs that should not be losses. In the merger area, there's a quite a bit of merger retrospective evidence now indicating that in some sectors, hospitals, healthcare, probably airlines, in others that we've we've allowed mergers that were uh, mergers have managed to get through that were um, that were less in competition contrary to the Clayton Act. So this can be fixed, but it um, it's either going to require you know the courts to move or Congress. But the line needs to be moved in a more aggressive direction, in my view. So I'll, I will let people disagree with that, but also as part of that, maybe address the question of if the if if we decide the line has to be moved. Can it be done within the, the existing legislative framework or does it require new legislation? I'll just say, I think in principle, it could be moved. It was moved by the courts, it could be moved back. I don't see the courts doing that right now in Sherman Act, given where the Supreme Court's at. Merger law, if I think by updating the guidelines and pressing, the agencies could move things back. It's not fast. If you want fast action or Sherman Act reform, I think you're gonna need Congress. Um, so, Tom, I wanted to jump in on a no, few no, a few no, of these no. questions. Um, look, the the issue of has antitrust enforcement been too lax? I think you also need to say, you know, what resources have been given to the antitrust enforcers? Right? There's this kind of you know wide you know <laughs> sort of <laughs> approach of like everyone you know previously fell down on the job, which, you know, I think is, you know, not supported. I mean, and it's very, it's very cherry picked. There's things they like and things they don't like, but apparently everyone who came uh, before the current crop of people was, uh, you know, asleep at the switch. I don't think that's right. I don't think that is supported. But some of the questions about, okay, where should things go and how should they go there? And, and what, you know, what's the basis for doing that? Uh, when you look at like you mentioned hospital mergers, or Carl mentioned hospital mergers. The FTC and the DOJ had lost a whole string of hospital mergers. And then when Tim Uris came in as chair, 
um, he did a merger retro hospital merger retrospective that created the I think um, economic um, evidence to show that the agency's predictions were right. Uh, and then, you know, kind of building on that, the agencies have had a, a big string of successful hospital merger challenges. Sometimes the district court gets it wrong. And then, you know, I was at the agency when we lost two, two in a row at district court, and then those got reversed uh, at, the, at the appellate court. Uh, we've seen movement uh, in, you know, understanding negotiating better and, and some of those things. So I, I, before we kind of say willy nilly, let's change everything at once. Uh, maybe we should look at the tools and give the agencies the resources to do some of that study to say, okay, wh where is something anti-competitive happening that we're not yet been able to challenge because the courts don't buy our evidence rather than what I think is happening right now is a lot of scattered concerns about things that aren't necessarily antitrust issues, but antitrust is seen as the tool with which to go around the inability to get Congress to change the law on privacy or labor or environmentalism or whatever issue one wants to throw into an antitrust analysis. Um, and, and that concerns me because I think we have a much more direct and appropriate route to do something like pass a federal privacy law, right? Rather than trying to distort antitrust into, into that role. So I, I think you need to look at resources things the FTC and DOJ have done successfully before to move antitrust law forward, because they have. I mean, not everyone may agree with the activist case, but I thought that was a really good case. It took the FTC, you know, a long time to get there, but they did. And that was under the previously, you know, disfavored <laughs> administration. There are several administrations who, who pursued that. And I, I'm sorry that that's kind of gotten uh, a little bit of short shrift. Let me uh, just quickly note too, sorry, before you move on. Um, I think that you, you started with this question about concentration. I do think, you know, we've seen lots of good academic papers addressing this issue of concentration. I don't think it's clear that concentration has, uh, you know, there are papers in both directions. I don't think it's clear that concentration has risen, but I nonetheless, I think, agree with Carl and Larry that uh, particularly in the area of merger enforcement, antitrust has been, uh, you know, the preponderance of the evidence is that antitrust has been too lax in recent years. But uh, let me endorse, I think we all probably, many of us at least, endorse uh, what Maureen said about resources, uh, resources that the agencies would, would, would probably play a big role. Um, well, the, the, um... Of course, the, pro the, the problem that most of the, that, that the issue that most of the, uh, that most of the prominent bills in Congress address is not antitrust generally, but it's re they're really uh, targeted at big tech and, and specifically at the four or five big firms. So, um, uh, so uh, that's the question. Should, should legislation be targeted at big tech at a small group of companies? Uh, primarily based on their size, as the current—I mean, all of the all of the, the House package and the two most prominent, as I see it, Senate bills are define, you know, define covered platforms in a very specific way to get these four or five firms. Is that is that is that good policy? Is that appropriate? So I, I think the problem here is that the these bills are fashioned as antitrust, but they're really proposing to regulate a certain sector um, differently than the rest of the economy. Um, and so, uh, and the basis, you might ask, well, what's the basis for regulating the sector? I would really urge people to go back and look at the report that the House Judiciary Committee issued in October of 2020, about a year ago, that is the evidentiary basis for these proposed legislation, okay? That's the way it works, right? They had hearings, they issued a detailed report, it's over 400 pages. And the key thing is, you know, it's very interesting. There was a, um, the, the, the people, the populace who are pushing behind this, they look at, there's a lot of stories in that report about evils that the big tech companies did. But from an antitrust perspective of people who've been doing this in enforcement of the courts, 
These are stories that don't land home, okay? So for example, Amazon Prime is viewed as a really bad thing because it, Amazon invested money and lost money for a while on Prime to build up customer loyalty and cross-selling of many different products, okay? Any antitrust person would say, well, that sort of sounds pro-competitive. They're investing to produce output and improve their brand and sell more stuff. But it's clearly seen as um, kind of a self-favoritism uh, using bigness in their favor. So if that whole report is like that, um, Doug Melamud had a very excellent blog post on ProMarket in January explaining how the report did not define what was anti-competitive, even though the stated purpose was to see if these companies are engaging in anti-competitive practices. It's pretty clear if you read it that what is thought to be anti-competitive is anything that's a lot, one of these large companies is doing that um, harms its competitors. <laughs> Okay, um, Okay. so which is, we learned a long time ago, that's not the right test for whether something's anti-competitive. And then nor does the report at all engage in, therefore, are the antitrust laws currently able to address this? Because all this conduct is assumed to be bad, and of course, it, but it's not caught by the laws, so that indicates supposedly the laws are inadequate. So the whole thing is a structure that doesn't really work in terms of if you take a view of promoting competition. If you take a view that you're trying to hem in these big companies and their efforts to grow and, and indeed compete and sometimes drive out of business, other companies, then it makes perfect sense. So we get back to what our goal is. Um, as one example, and then I'll stop, but I think this is the, all the bills follow from the logic of that report. The report says it wants to be illegal for, a, I'm quoting now, a dominant platform to make a design change that excludes competitors regardless of whether the design change can be justified as an improvement for consumers. Okay, so if that's, your, if that's the world, then of course you have to change the law, okay? But that's not what antitrust law has right. been about or in well, my view should be about. Yeah. This has all the flavor, and I, I guess this is what Josh was referring to uh, in his early remarks, of the 1930s approach of we have to protect small businesses when we got things like the Robinson Patent Act, like the um, you know national endorsement of resale price maintenance because it was going to help the local pharmacists and the local grocer uh, deal with the chain stores. I think we're seeing a revival of that kind of. Um, you know, help small businesses regardless of the efficiency consequences. Josh, is that what you were referring to when you talked about the experiment of other goals? That, that among other things, um, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, that's exactly right. I mean, if you read the, the Section 7 Clayton Act decisions from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, you get the same sort of, yeah. you know, let's maximize were, six yeah. things right. at at once. All the traders and worthy men. Brown shoes. All traders and worthy everybody's men. Everybody's right. favorite. Uh, so uh, we can all we can all nod and say, well, that's not what an antitrust supposed to be about because it hasn't been for forty years or fifty. Oh, but years. It, it is. It, is not, it might part, be again, right? That may be where we're going. Well, it's right. also partly what antitrust is like it is about in Europe too, right? I mean, they're okay. much more cognizant of effects on competitors, right? Tom, let me let me uh, because everyone agreed on the more resources point, and it's fun to disagree on something. Let me m tell a, a cautionary story here that the one of the leading authors of the report that Carl described in ways I fully agree with. Um, I mean, the report called for with go read it for yourself, but not not a lot of real evidence uh, overturning every Supreme Court decision since 1977 and overturning a law review article. I don't know what it means to overturn a law review article. I'm mostly jealous and want someone to do that to one of my articles, but um, based on whatever, the author of that report is running the FTC um, and wants to do rulemaking to do some of those things if Congress doesn't, or maybe even if Congress does, right? Um, she has said, and, and you know, credit to her for saying, uh, for, for to, to Lena for being direct about what she wants to do. It is in the articles, it is in the report. She has said, we would like to do rulemaking that goes further than what's in the Cicilline report. 
that was a, a compromise document so they could peel off Ken Buck and a Republican or two who's excited to punish uh, big tech companies. They would like to do that through rulemaking. We will have fights in the courts like, a, you know, net neutrality style litigation for years to come. Um, but if that's what my increase in budget to the FTC is going to, um, I, don't, I don't want on that bus. Uh, I, 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 re I really don't. I think that that's a step backwards. Um, they've told us it's coming. I believe them. And it makes me nervous. Uh, I would not be nervous about saying, you know what, you think there are good cases you can bring. There's anti-competitive conduct. You would like to bring more cases and your, your resource constrained. Here are some more resources. Uh, here's some more resources. Let's push the constraint out. That's not what they're saying. Um, maybe they can do, do both of those things at the same time, right? But um, the, I, I, I just would like to put into the discussion the set of alternatives on the table are not just the things we can think of here. The Federal Trade Commission is a vote away from doing, you know, alternatives that don't. They've got a petition from open markets to do to go back to the 1968 guidelines. They have said openly, and they're getting rid of the VMGs, that there's no such thing as an efficiencies defense for horizontal mergers either under Section 7, just as a reading of the statute. Um, that's what will be in the new horizontal merger guidelines. I bet anybody here, beer, right? Um, they've said, you know, not to mention the prior approval stuff. I mean, the agency is doing the things it is doing right now. And so the idea of putting some extra zeros in the agency's budget um, is one that, you know, I, I am torn over because to the extent that under the existing standard, it means we can agree there's some cases they would bring that they wouldn't otherwise, that, that's great. Uh, but there's pretty clearly more than that going on and some things the agency is doing that I suspect um, make everybody uh, here at least a little bit nervous. Do you feel the same way about the antitrust division in the U.S. Department of Justice, Josh? They've had a guy running it for one and a half days, uh, you know, um, so I don't know yet. And they've also, uh, you know, I read his hearing. He says, you know, he kind of sort of likes the consumer welfare standard, but it makes him nervous or whatever. Um, you know, somewhat nervous because he's announced he's going to do, you know, is in favor of what Ali whatever Alina wants to do. Um, but I'll give the guy more than more than 48 hours before before I decide or lose sleep over it. The other, the other thing about the DOJ, let me say to answer directly, Larry, I am systematically less worried about the DOJ because they got to go to Article Three courts to get their job done. They have got to go to court and face judicial review and appeal and, and so forth. Um, they don't have rulemaking. They don't have some of the other tools that the FTC has available. They don't have jamming privacy stuff into consumer protection. And they also don't have what some consider the magic wand of unfair methods of competition. That means something more than, <laughs> than traditional antitrust law. But what more we all wait with bated breath to see. Yeah, and I guess they also don't have the administrative law judge uh, internal trial uh, process uh, as well. I, I think the unfair competition, you read that report again, there's a very clear sense that if a big company gets some advantages because of size or scope, and that that's put smaller companies under pressure, that often is unfair. Okay, and um, look, it's for Congress to tell me, tell us what they want to do here. Okay, um, but I do worry that that view would actually stifle rather than promote competition. Well, do you worry 19, also? It's the 1930s with, again. Do you worry? Yeah. Do you have to share Josh's concern that uh, it would be worse if the agencies, particularly the FTC, had more more resources? <sighs> you know, I I I I'm sympathetic to what Josh uh, has said, but geez, you know, there are a whole bunch of mergers uh, that are flooding both agencies right now and i'd like them to be doing a good review and you know their budgets have not increased substantially their workload just on the merger side has um it's unfair to the 
you know, very talented men and women in the legal staffs, in the economic staffs at the commission to be putting a burden on them. And, you know, unfair to us as, uh, you know, citizens, members of the economy, that they're not going to be able to do as good a job because they won't have the resources. So I would, grit, I, I would grit my teeth and, and go with more resources. You know, I would love to see Congress say, here's a lot more resources and the FTC to state, either you do or you don't have this rulemaking authority. Because I'm concerned there'll be a lot of effort on rulemaking only to find that the Supreme Court will say, no, what are you talking about? I mean, recent decisions that make call that really into question. I'm not a lawyer, I don't know the answer, but it would be a shame and a waste to do all that and three years from now, there was no, the authority wasn't there. So, and there'd be all the business uncertainty in the interim. So it'd be great if Congress could clear that up. Yeah, I, I would agree. I do think the agencies need more resources, but not without guardrails, I think, <laughs> to say, you, you know, put it towards A, B, and C. Now, of course, you know, money is fungible and the money you can pull from one program because new funds come in and devote to another that may, uh, I share Carl's, you know, concern uh, and, and I, I am a lawyer and I believe the FTC doesn't have UMC rulemaking authority and, you know, kind of spending years wrangling on that, you know, it's a missed opportunity to actually focus on some things where you could improve antitrust law for the benefit of not just the FTC, right, and the FTC's enforcement, but for all antitrust enforcement, which is another missed opportunity if you go down just the UMC route because only the FTC enforces the FTC Act. Now there's some state things that are similar, but it means the DOJ, who's, you know, not, uh, you know, doesn't have that authority is kind of cut out of the picture. Let me, let me go into, to, to, into a little bit more detail on, on uh, some of the bills. I mean, so, several people have said they thought, uh, thought on, on the margin, um, uh, merger enforcement, uh, I guess, has been too lax. But, but the bills really don't talk about merger enforcement. I mean, even even the bills the bills that are directed at mergers don't talk about merger enforcement in general. They talk specifically about acquisitions by the four or five biggest tech companies. So, and, and what I'm thinking about particularly are the, the Platform Competition and Opportunity Act in the House uh, by Jeffries and Buck, and in the Se and in the Senate. Uh, Klobuchar and Cotton have a, a similar bill, uh, which would uh, place, um, you know, pretty high burdens on acquisitions by those companies. Uh, you know, is that a good thing? Should, uh, should acquisitions uh, of nascent or potential competitors by tech platforms be essentially banned? Uh, and, you know, how do we identify those companies? So I'll just say, I think, um, you know, I, I do think that nascent competitor enforcement is important. What I don't understand completely, I mean, I think a, a misguided aspect of these acts is we probably, we care about nascent competitor enforcement, whether or not it involves these companies. Um, and, you know, I think nascent competitor enforcement, you know, can be challenging. Um, but I think, you know, if we think that we should shift the burden of proof somewhat on uh, nascent competitor enforcement, I don't see what's gained by limiting that to a certain number of companies. I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the agencies have brought some nascent competitor cases, I would call Visa Plaid a uh, nascent competitor case. Um, I would, you know, there's, I think there's been two of the razor cases. Um, so there, there are cases in other juris, they're in other industries. I think, you know, I think it's a reasonable debate whether the burden of proof should shift a bit in nascent competitor cases to be a little more, uh, you know, age, plaintiff friendly. But if so, I don't, I don't, it seems like to address just the issues with these platform companies is kind of missing the opportunity to take a look at antitrust more generally. Well, let me, I really wanna strongly agree with you, Judy, and, and add to that a little bit. I think a good discipline for Congress is if you believe a certain principle applies to these tech companies, does it apply to dominant firms generally? 
okay? And if it doesn't, why are you doing something different in this sector, okay? Now, I think it, I have favored, well, I'd say I'm open, let's put it this way, to an approach that says if you've got a dominant firm and they're acquiring a potential competitor, that we, we would have maybe some presumption against that with some sort of notion of what potential or nation competitor is, okay? Uh, I'm open to that. I think the, the law is too, it, it makes it too hard for the government to win those cases. But this legislation now, first off, okay, if you like that principle, go for it across the economy. But it's more than that. The covered platforms, which are the regulated firms here, an acquisition of any product or service, okay, it's any product or service where they compete, not in necessarily in something where they're dominant. So, you know, that's like, wait, why are you doing that? It seems too broad. Um, I, I think in any competition for the user's attention. So, you know, one of a platform wants to acquire some content, you know, to do a better service of some sort. Like, it just seems like it's not structured to deal with, with to stopping companies from buying emerging threats to their dominance, which is what, that's what we should be doing. It's not well structured. And if you did this for the whole economy, it would, people would say that's crazy. So that's a warning. Yeah. And let me just say again, right, the focus on the potential, the nascent, but as in this sector, what gets forgotten, and, and that's right, focus on that. But in this, in the tech sector, what does get forgotten in these kinds of conversations is that you know, we've got lots of potential innovation occurring and the business model of a lot of these innovators is, uh, I, you know, one way to monetize is to go public, yeah, but another is to get bought by somebody. Now, we don't want the purchase to be anti-competitive, but to the extent that you have an overly broad, again, drawing the line in the wrong place for, um, especially for this sector, you discourage the innovation process in the first place because, you know, potential buyers uh, won't be there um, for even non-competitive, um, uh, non uh, threatening uh, type mergers. So we got to remember dynamics. We got to remember long run innovation as well. And it's really important in this sector. Um, and, and let me just build on what Larry is saying about the impact on uh, who will be acquired and under what circumstances, because these bills are targeted at a small, I mean, depending on the definitions, you know, maybe as few as four or five US companies, right? And so are we, What's the concern here? I mean, a lot of it seems to be, and I think to Carl's point, not that they're acquiring nascent competitors who would otherwise grow up and, and um, threaten their dominance in some market, but that they're improving their products or they're moving into adjacent markets and they're creating new competition there and that somehow that, that's bad, right? And so, um, so we want somehow to, to stop that. Uh, and so if we don't have them doing these purchases, I mean, these bills don't necessarily seem to apply to, for example, growing Chinese um, platform companies or, you know, other, other outside the U.S. interests. Um, and I, I think the distortive effect of that has sort of been swept, swept under the rug. Um, and then one other thing that I want to mention is, why are we just focusing on these companies? Has there been any comparison of similar kinds of acquisitions in other industries. And I think that, you know, if you look back, there's certainly been a lot of acquisitions in the financial space, right? And, but the bill's not targeted to that. Um, and so wh why not? What is the, you know, the foundation, the, you know, the evidentiary foundation for saying there's a unique problem that only impacts, you know, four or five American companies whose um, market value, whose market cap was a certain amount on a certain date um, which is also a very strange way to, uh, to, to narrow this 
down as where the problems are. If you look at the uh, the, diff the hundreds of transactions that these, these big four or five firms have undertaken over the past 10 or 15 years, it's very useful to do. The Washington Post had a very nice uh, display of all this. I recommend people go look at about six months ago. And look, I'm happy to say, you know, maybe, you know, maybe should Facebook have been allowed to buy Instagram? Should Google been allowed to buy Waze? You know, you, you can look at a, a bunch of them look kind of sketchy. Okay, what happened? But you have to be careful how to look at the time, but you do that. But there's hundreds, of, hundreds, almost all of them are small aqua hires or adding some capability often so that they can attack each other, you know, in different places. So to just to say broad brush, well, all of these are presumptively anti-competitive unless there's, that just seems to me, what are you doing? And the answer, you go back to that report. You are trying to keep these companies in a box and not let them grow and expand and, 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 and indeed compete in other areas. That's, so that, that's a different goal. The goal that I would rather have them focus on is not buying competitors who could threaten your dominant position. And that should be applied to the whole economy. In fact, that you don't need a change in law for that, do you? I think you do, actually. Well, again, the courts could do it, but it's so hard for the government to win these cases because they can't get... I'm not sure what happened there. Yeah, I think his home Wi-Fi must have, or that's probably home Wi-Fi, uh, froze on him. Yeah, yeah Carl, you... And, and let me add one thing about the difficulty. So um, the government has brought these kinds of cases. So when I was uh, chair, we brought a challenge to um, an acquisition called CDK Automate. And the theory was, you know, acquisition of a nascent competitor to take them out of market and the parties abandoned the deal, right? So it just wasn't the tech company um, that is being pilloried of, at the day. It was actually a tech focused <laughs> acquisition. Um, so I, 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 you know, do wonder, uh, you know, uh, if it's really true that the government doesn't have the ability to, to challenge to challenge these things. Right. And one of the reasons why it's a great example, Maureen, and one of the reasons why, I mean, you know, one of the things, among other things, uh, missing from the win loss rate is the transactions that the government says, hey, we're going to challenge and then the parties run away. There were 13 of those last year. Um, and you can infer what you like from the fact that the parties, when they, when the agency announced we're going to file a complaint, the parties run uh, 12 times or 13 times last year uh, and a couple this year, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple more this year. Um, the state of the law for the dominant firm acquisitions, I mean, you're over the PNB threshold every time. Um, the, those transactions are already under existing law presumptively unlawful. You could do stuff to tinker with welcome, it. Welcome and, back, Carl. Hey, Carl. Um, you could do stuff to tinker with the presumption if you like, but those are presumptively unlawful. Now, I think that's one of the reasons you see parties run when the agency announces they're going to challenge. But what, PI, PI standards low. I, I mean, uh, what, what, I'm not a lawyer, but what about this general thing that uh, uh, Judy brought up and, you know, the shifting of the burden of proof? And I, I don't think it's a bit. It's basically... And it's in this bill, and, and I think most, of, if not all, of the other bills, um, is, is that is that is that a good idea? I don't I don't think so. Um, but I would, you know, I may be the wrong person to ask. I'd get rid of PNB too, um, and I'd make the government go to court and and, and prove that it's got anti-competitive effects in all the cases. I don't think they need a presumption to do it. Um, you know, but the truth of the matter is, as long as PNB sits there, you know, I, I, I hear people make the claim that PNB has been weakened. I don't think that that proves out in the data. People don't come back from PNB too often. Uh, and when, and when the government announces it's going to sue, people head for the hills. People aren't looking to litigate merger cases against the government because they think the law is weak. It happens for sure. Um, but the number of times firms in the last two decades have come back from the invocation of the presumption, I can count on one hand. I mean, the PNB presumption is, is, you know, it is important. It makes all of these transactions that we're talking about already presumptively unlawful. 
Carl would like the 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 presumption to be more substantial. I you know I I would like it to be be less, but you know that's just stuff we want. The law is right now that those transactions are presumptively unlawful under Section Seven. If you've defined the market in, or delineated a, a market in some appropriate fashion. Any post-merger share over 30s. I don't think the agencies have brought a case that wouldn't trigger that for a really long time. And just to also point out, uh, Commissioner Christine Wilson had a really good paper on this, how uh, over time markets have been, fine, been defined more and more narrowly, right? So then the, the presumption plays you know, and even in a smaller market can play an even more outsized role, so. Okay, well, let's let's shift uh, shift to uh, another subject that's covered by the bills, this uh, this issue of self, self-preferencing, which is uh, in, the, in the Klobuchar-Grassley bill uh, and the uh, Cicilline bill. Um, just what, what do you all make of those, of those, uh, of those provisions? Um, man, such a mistake. Uh, and, uh, you know, first you start with the uh, idea of your local supermarket carrying house brands. And do we think it's a bad thing that Amazon is carrying house brands as well, and maybe even featuring them a little bit? Uh, the, the idea of that self-preferencing is automatically a bad thing, uh, I think is, uh, again, misguided. And um, also, one forgets, in essence, that kind of concern about self-preferencing is, is saying these guys have market power. And what gets forgotten is, if it's not, if, if it is being exercised by pushing their own brands. There are lots of other ways they will be able to do it. They'll uh, come to some kind of understanding with a third party uh, supplier that they'll give them better terms. They'll put them on the first screen uh, in return for some kind of um, uh, financial reward. And so uh, you go down that path of no self-preferencing you're in you're opening up a regulatory morass that i don't think the courts ought to be in in the first place um it it just feels very wrong-headed to me if there are particular instances of abuse then fine either that's a contract issue or maybe it's a and you know that particular instance, and maybe it happened a few times. Fine, let's look at it as a potential that particular set of circumstances anti-competitive issue. If it's not just a contract dispute, but to rule out, uh, you know, Amazon being able to offer its own brands, man, that's a big mistake. Uh, let me give another example from the House Judiciary Report, and Amazon actually. So one of the things that they found was that Amazon, in when you search for products, they give a favor, they, they give higher ranking to a product that's fulfilled by Amazon. Okay. Um, okay. And this was in the report, it's like, this is obviously unfair to people who don't want to do it. My reaction, I think most people who do antitrust would be, well, if Amazon has a judgment that it's more reliable. <laughs> Uh, faster fulfillment, and there was some stuff related to Prime that was similar. Um, then we we think customer our experience is customers have been happy with that, so we're going to rank that. In fact, Amazon said, according to the report, that they rank things according to the, how they would predict what people would want if they actually spent all shocking. the time. That's okay, shocking, that's shocking, Carl. Okay, shocking. okay. So it's just an example. They self preference through f fulfillment by Amazon. So I just think what what the People, on the other hand, self-preferencing, it seems so unfair to favor your own stuff, discriminate against others. So this is very appealing and it's clear it has a lot of, a lot of support in Congress, these bills. So all I ask is that um, people who are supporting that take the time to think through what sort of practices would be outlawed. 
a lot of practices that are beneficial in this sector and others. Maybe they think it's worth it, okay? But just to understand what they would be doing, I'm not, I don't know how much people understand it, and the regulatory regime that would be necessary to, to define that and enforce that, particularly in, a, in industries where you know, the, the market's changing rapidly. Apple decides they want to offer a new service. They want to pre-install their version of it on the iPhone when you get the iPhone. Well, that's self-preferencing. There's, what are they supposed to install? Everybody's version? Are they going to tell all third party? What do they do, right? Do they have a choice screen right. for everything? Mm-hmm. So it's a, there's a big regulatory regime. And uh, just people should understand doing non-discrimination by regulation is very hard. And um, you better put in resources and have a regulator to do it and understand what you're doing. That's all I ask. So let me, right. let me, and, and let, me let me just let me, add, let me. we don't want to go back to the 1980, not forget about the 30s, the 1980s and 1990s, when one federal district court judge, Harold Green, was making these, I think, you know, certainly dozens, if not hundreds of regulatory decisions that affected our telecommunications system. Again, that's just not a good way of uh using the judicial system uh, if we are going to regulate but it's going to be a morass regulate with a regulatory agency not with the federal judiciary or not with the federal antitrust enforcement agencies so carl let me see if i can paraphrase what you just said and tell me tell me if it's accurately uh, reflects what you just said that this let for take take the case of amazon is both anti-consumer because it would deprive consumers of choice, but it's also anti the, the, the many small businesses who use use the Amazon platform and use the Amazon fulfillment services. Well, I think that's debatable and that's why uh, that's that debate is going on. You can take the view that um, if Amazon has can't self-preference, They'll just say, fine, let's not even have a marketplace. Let's just do our own stuff. Go back to being a retailer without third parties. That would be very bad for all these sellers. Amazon's been a very valuable platform. But the other side would be Amazon, then the third party sellers there will get a better deal. And there's a lot in that House Judiciary Report about how they're, how they're, they're reliant on Amazon, Amazon squeezing them, Amazon's not treating them well. So that would be the other side. Would Amazon treat them better? Okay, that's an empirical question. Amazon can speak to it, maybe. I'm just saying to do it, you'd have to have a lot of regulations and we need, we need a regulatory agency to do that. And you should be aware of many pro-consumer things that, that would not be allowed anymore. Let me, let me, ask, let me put a, ask, a, ask a question in a slightly different way. Are these self-preferencing provisions in effect equivalent to the kind of uh, line of business, these conflict, conflict of interest provisions in the in the in a different bill, the Jayapal bill, uh, would they would they essentially have the same effect? I don't think it's nearly as harsh as as that. Uh, look, if Amazon would respond, to, just to give them as an example, to the no preferencing by saying, "Fine, we're not going to have any." Third, we're not we're going to get rid of the Amazon marketplace, okay, uh, and just sell our own stuff. Then um, it would partly go in that direction. But again, the, the 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 line of business restriction. I'm not sure they could still have Amazon Web Services, for example. No, I know, I'm but sure they can offer a music service. I mean, I just I don't. They can't. It's much much. Stricter. And video. Yeah. Right. Video. So uh... I, I don't think they're the same. Those bills are not the same. They at would all. be the same as far as being a platform for other other. Uh, no, I don't think so. Tom. I, look, look, all of them would find some way. Could, to could look, by the way, Europe is Europe has some rules. Look, look at the Digital Markets Act. This is not just theoretical. Europe has a bunch of rules that they're going to have to comply with. Let's just see what the hell happens over there, including non. There, there's there's push against self preferencing there too. It's not the same as lines of business restrictions. We'll see what the Europeans do. It's there's a starting in 2023, is my understanding, is when that's going to go into effect. Well, let me before we move to another subject, and you know, obviously the Google case that the FTC considered, you know, in in 2000 rejected, I guess in 2013 was about was about self preferencing. Um, should the FTC have have proceeded with that case? Probably have a couple of people here who might have been 
around at that time? <laughs> well, I, other than to say that uh, as has been leaked to the press, the FTC staff did not recommend <laughs> going forward with that part of the case. So uh, I don't right. think it was a good idea to, to try to move forward on something where there was uh, little support. Um, all right, let's, uh, this is, we have a, a few minutes left and, uh, and let me, and let's just have a look, talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the, uh, the proposals that deal with portability and interoperability. Um, I guess the first question is, are switching costs really high for all these platforms? Well, all right. Well, I, I, let me jump in on the port of, uh, on the interoperability. Uh, question, because I've been thinking about it a lot, especially in the context of Facebook, where uh, at least my perception is the network externalities are phenomenal here. Um, yes, we've had a history where previous social uh, networks have stumbled and fallen. There was MySpace before Facebook. There was Friendster before MyFace. Uh, MySpace, but geez, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, I, I don't see a stumble, you know, and they've had some stumbles and not- There is, there is, now, there is now TikTok. Right, right. Uh, but, uh, you know, if uh, the Tom Leonard social network wanted to start up, Tom would have a lot of trouble attracting users because you know, not impossible, again, TikTok, but uh, because uh, anybody he approaches is going to say, so uh, my friends aren't on your network. Uh, even if you want me to sample it, I don't, I, this, there's nothing to sample. Sorry, Tom. However, if there could be some kind of interoperability where the Tom Leonard network users would be able to access their friends on the Facebook network and vice versa. This needn't mean stealing intellectual property. It's just an interoperability. Now I make it sound very simple. Uh, and you know, the telephone network interoperability is a good, uh, I think metaphor for this, but still it's a lot more complicated than just saying, hey, make it interoperable because uh, the dominant firm is going to want to create static to uh, make that interoperability less desirable than a nice clear interchange uh, that you know firms are going to say yeah but if I want to do um, technological progress uh, that what about that interoperability there, there's lots of complications it's a regulatory issue not you know, shouldn't be in the judiciary again. This is the one time when I am sympathetic to a regulatory solution. I don't like the idea of breaking up Facebook. There's no physical assets to break up. This is not AT&T in 1984 or Standard Oil in, 20, in 1911. Um, interoperability to me, again, it's regulatory. It makes me wince a little bit. But to me, it's the only solution. Put it in the FCC or the FTC, uh, but get that's the way to allow the Tom Leonard networks to well, be that, able that to. Is, that, I think that is what the access the Access Act does. That it sets up a regulatory mechanism in the FTC to can, establish can, standards, etc. Can I can I weigh in on yeah. that point? The FTC is not a technical agency. Right, and that the idea that the FTC is going to be there blessing every change, right, with some to be named committee um, <laughs> under no particular time limits um, is extremely puzzling and, and, concern, and concerning to me. Um, some, some of the other issues involving interoperability, which we're also seeing in some of the Senate bills, is also it doesn't lay down some kind of clear standard, right? It says, essentially, um, business users have a writ large have a right to inter interoperability. Um, 
and the platform can stop them under certain grounds. And if the platform guesses wrong, it's subject to possibly punishing <laughs> or crippling um, fines, right? So you have this situation where, and, and some of these bills, there's, you know, this gives access to state-owned enterprises of other countries. They, they're, the burden is on the platform to defend itself. And so you could see how this could be gamed in a way, ultimately the person asking for, you know, access to interoperate with the platform and, you know, do these things may not have a hope of winning the case, but it'd be really hard to get it dismissed. They would, because of the way the burden's been shifted, uh, the platform would have to, in discovery, provide all sorts of information that could be competitively sensitive. Um, and so I think, I, I don't think it is akin to setting up, you know, an, an, an FCC type of, you know, phone company regulation. I, this is putting all the risk on the platform that is, you know, to fight it off or to get it wrong. Um, and it's, it's extremely burdensome. And I think it will have the incentive for them to provide, you know, uh, less of the kinds of protections that on wearing its other hat, the FTC has been pretty aggressive on saying firms should put in place. So I, I have big, big concerns with how this is being teed up. Even if interoperability as like at the consumer's request or at the, um, you know, the platform deciding it wants to do some form of interoperability may not be as problematic as putting it all in the hands of, um, well, all comers essentially. Well, let me... There's just no light regulatory solution to interoperability. Like if you're in, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. Like you need a huge structure, uh, you need a whole rule setting body, you need someone to adjudicate. You know, is this truly fully interoperable? I mean, I'm not sure that the enforcement of the Telecom Act of 1990 was was easy, right, for the FCC. I mean, this, I mean, I think there is a lot of, you know, to be learned perhaps from that history, but it's, it's a big undertaking. Um, I, I, I agree with Larry, this, it's a real, I agree with Larry that it's a real regulatory solution uh, with a lot of regulatory infrastructure. I therefore disagree with Larry that I'm so sure that it's a good idea. I don't know any other I think, way. I think that my concern is, is that Congress has been mostly hearing from third parties who feel aggrieved and who in many cases are sympathetic in terms of, you know, I couldn't get access to customers, the big guys froze me out, whatever. I just think they should hear more from people who have experience with regulation, just the realities of it. How did regulation work with telecom? What are the problems? What would be, what would be involved here in enforcing this? Um, look, I am sympathetic to some of these some of these ideas about basically reducing switching costs to, to lower entry barriers, but I am very concerned the way these bills have come out again based on that report that you know you have a lot of stories there, but where's the experience and knowledge about the regulatory regime that would be required to make this work and and uh, and the, the what we've what many of us have learned over the decades about how hard that is. Let me uh, let me have one one final question since we're uh, out of time. Um, like each of you, if you, each of you could say if if there is one provision change of law that you. Uh, could see get wave, wave a wand and get enacted. What would it be? And it's also so you're also allowed to say you don't you know none no no change in law. But if there's one thing that you think the Congress could do to make to improve things, uh, what would it be? And uh, or you can say nothing. So. Uh, uh, should we start, maybe uh, start with Judy? Sure, I'll start. I would say uh, if there was one thing, I would say a, um, 
a universal, not targeted at particular companies, um, modest <laughs> shift in the burden of proof on nascent competitor issues in mergers. I think I think that if I could ask for one thing, I think that is the one thing where I think uh, we could see some improvement. Uh, and I think you know what I'm suggesting is fairly modest. Um, but I think you know for some of the reasons we've talked about in, in a universal sense. Josh. I'll go in an unpopular direction, and I would say repeal PNB. Um, why don't you just, for the audience who might not be, do you want to just, I know you've talked about it before, but just explain what that entails. Your PN Philadelphia National Bank is the Supreme Court case that makes a presumption that any transaction with a post-merger share over 30% is unlawful under the Clayton Act. If the government shows that without anything about the competitive effects of the transaction, it is sufficient to shift the burden to the defendants in all merger cases for to show an entry defense or an efficiencies defense or, or sort of something else. Uh, I think it's a distraction from doing the real economics in those cases, and I think that the agencies can win those cases without it. Carl? Uh, I would favor... Uh, a presumption, again, through through Act of Congress, uh, that mergers that involve um, the elimination of substantial direct competition between the merging companies are presumed to be illegal unless um, some contrary evidence, clear and convincing evidence shows otherwise. Larry? Uh, um, all right, since I'm the last, no, I guess uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't spoken yet. I'm, You're the penultimate, Larry. Oh, I was right. Sorry, Maureen. Sorry, Maureen. I was going to cheat. I'll still cheat uh, and and do two. One is expand the budgets with the uh, guardrail suggestion that uh, Maureen added, but also something that hasn't come up: uh, exemptions uh, from the antitrust laws. Uh, you know if. if Eliminate them all, eliminate most of them. Uh, you know, enlightened modern antitrust can deal with almost all of the justifications that uh, legitimate that led to uh, exemptions of the insurance industry, of professional sports, of agriculture, uh, of ocean shipping. Uh, get rid of it and get it back into the heart of antitrust. Get rid of those exemptions. And now, the, now Maureen. Yeah. Sorry, Maureen. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, so to take it in a slightly different direction, I think Congress should pass a federal privacy law that imposes uniform standards across all industries, not just pick up four companies. Uh, and a lot of the bills actually have a um, data portability provision in them, but at the request of the consumer. So they retain the control over it, not this idea that antitrust trumps privacy and, and things need to be shared without the consumer's um, uh, approval. So, um, so because I think a lot of the concerns that are being raised um, about big platforms, big tech, and th things like that are competitor concerns. And to the extent they are consumer concerns, they often focus around feeling of a loss of control over their data. Okay, well, I, uh, I wanna thank everybody for a really interesting discussion. I appreciate you all taking the time. Uh, and uh, I think now we will, I can figure out how to sign off here. We will, we will, <laughs> we will stop. Thanks thank you, Tom.